Okay, so I um, wanted to go on to uh, our next topic, which is uh, introducing the database side of things in this class. And so, you know, first week, here we are, um, we're about a week in, and we've introduced Node and what is Node and um, what is uh, Express. And we, you know, basically got those things up and running and writing JavaScript to have a web server right, running on top of JavaScript and servicing requests and solving some problems. Um, but ultimately we need to start uh, persisting data in a database. And so um, this, this lecture is an introduction not only to MongoDB, um, but, but also just kind of a general, um, a little bit of a general discussion around um, just different technologies that are out there um, because we are looking at one technology stack, but there's some other things out there. Um, so, um, but, but, you know, by and large, uh, working with data, working with databases, we're going to start doing that uh, this week. And so our applications are ultimately uh, going to work with that uh, database. That's why they call it full stack, uh, meaning the front end, what the user sees, the back end is not only the application tier, what sometimes they call the, the, the back end a combination of the middle tier, which is the application, and then the database. You know, that database is really, you know, always considered back end code. Um, and so kind of the first thing I put on this slide is, you know, go ahead and follow MongoDB on YouTube. Um, kind of go to their channel here and um, sift through their playlist. I will tell you uh, for my personal um, you know, journey learning Mongo, um, I thought they, I think they put together really good videos. And so, you know, um, just go ahead and give them a follow if you, if you learn um, off of YouTube like, like I do, um, this is a, a great resource. I've also, uh, join their newsletter. And so I get the occasional emails um, about um, seminars and different events that are going on. You could see here that, you know, um, there's a bunch of different events that they do. Um, so kind of start with that. And I think the video that I link to, um, if you kind of click on this, is a crash course on That's Mongo, um, which we can watch, you know, maybe at another time, you know, instead of this is a long format lecture on Mongo, this is kind of the exactly that 10 minute jumpstart crash course. So if you need a refresher, maybe after this. Um, and so moving on, um, you know, it's worth taking a minute to just discuss what we're doing in this class um, in that we are developing in what's referred to as the MERN technology stack. And so when it comes to building software, um, a, a stack is a group of related technologies that work well together. And so I made two slides here, just kind of outlining a lot of the popular technology stacks, just as a, uh, you know, FYI, this is the kind of stuff that's out there when you're building um, web applications. Now kind of backing up, of course, you can develop different kinds of applications. Um, you can develop desktop apps. You know, for example, if you're looking at my screen, um, all these apps down here, you know, be it Discord, be it Microsoft Teams, be it GitHub Desktop, Postman, OBS, Visual Studio, those are all desktop apps. So desktop apps in 2023 are not extinct. Clearly there's a lot of apps that are very commonly used and developed and, and built for the desktop. Um, so there are, that's one mode of development. Another mode or type of application that you could build, of course, is mobile apps. Um, mobile apps, you know, kind of came on the scene uh, with the invention of the iPhone. So spitball it call it 2007 and you know back in 2007 uh 2008 2009 2010 you kind of see this trend of mobile apps and certainly mobile apps are another way you can build software um turns out in, in the world of mobile 
Um, you basically have what are your mega apps, the popular apps that everybody uses, be it TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, you know, you know, the Ebays and you know, there are mega apps. Um, but most companies and companies are and companies do develop for mobile, but it's, it's not, um, a huge industry as compared to web apps. So when you're looking at, Hey, I can build desktop apps. I can build mobile apps or I can build web apps. The biggest job demand is for web applications. And so that's what we teach. We teach web application development because we're trying to prepare our students for as many jobs as possible. When it comes to web development, you know, these are, uh, these are the technology stacks that you can develop with. This class is, is referred to as MERN, very similar to MEAN. You'll see that there's basically one difference there. MERN is Mongo, which we're going to learn today uh, and for the rest of the week. Express, we've doubled with Express. Certainly there's more to learn about Express. Node, certainly there's more to learn about Node, but you've introduced to Node and React. React is also as part of this course. We're building full stack web applications with MERN. Um, and so if you, if you throw out the R and replace the A, another huge JavaScript framework is uh, Angular. For a long time, there was no clear winner uh, between the front end, which is React or Angular. Um, React has been trending to be the winner uh, for some time now, and I can you know kind of back that up with some data. Um, but it would appear, at least to me, as an, as an observer, that React is um, beating Angular as far as popularity in the in the industry goes um, an old school technology stack uh, again kind of predating all this javascript stuff is called lamp lamp has been around a long time linux apache mysql and php um, or you can replace the php with uh, python or Perl. Um, you know when you're looking at the internet and how many websites are on there Turns out not a lot of people know how to code. When people don't know how to code, they turn to tools like WordPress um, to help them develop sites. And, and WordPress is an example of a content management system built on top of LAMP. And so um, because WordPress was so popular, um, you know, this became a technology stack that gained a lot of popularity, mainly because of WordPress and similar kind of tools. Uh, they would always run on top of a Linux operating system. Apache is your web server. MySQL is your database. And PHP or Python was your application logic. Um, and so those are um, pretty popular. Not as familiar with, with LIMP, to be honest. Uh, Django. Python's really gaining popularity. Um, and then the database would be what that's, that's referred to as Postgres. Um, Postgres is a really popular database system. And so you kind of have uh, Python that's out there. Um, kind of continuing, um, another technology stack that we teach at Rankin is the .NET technology stack. So I highlight that there. Um, a lot of companies prefer working with Microsoft. Microsoft is kind of trusted, you know, they're their desktops are on Windows 10 or Windows 11. Their servers are on the server product line, server 16, server 19. They just came out, I think, with server 22. Um, they're, they're in the ecosystem as all of, uh, you know, the students typically, once you're in an ecosystem, be it iOS or be it Apple, you're kind of married to that ecosystem. And so, because corporate America in general trusts Microsoft, uh, they're kind of married into an ecosystem, be it Office and all the bundling products and Microsoft Teams, and you got all the servers and all the clients, and you know it's all running Windows. So .NET has always kind of been popular because of corporate America's love for uh, for Microsoft. 
Um, Ruby on Rails uh, was really gaining a lot of popularity some years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Um, kind of never really um, took anything over as far as, you know, um, like being the number one technology stack. Uh, Java, um, and so Grant, who's my one live listener to this, Grant um, knows I went out to lunch with, uh, with an alumni who's now hiring our graduates. And I was asking my alumni, who's been out in the industry for seven years now, I said, you know, what, what are you working with? And, and his answer was Java. And his concern with Java is that Java's getting old. I mean, Java was made in the 90s. And his thing was, hey, I, I want to work with more modern development. More modern development is exactly what you saw on this first page. Mern and Mean. Um, this, these are kind of the, the gold standard technology stacks today. And so, you know, this graduate who I was just having lunch with, he said, hey, I'm working with Java and if, if my employer doesn't give me the opportunity to start developing in other languages, you know, uh, I might have to look for other opportunities because it, it's old is what Java is. Um, and um, on the back end of Java, uh, you have, again, you have Postgres. On the back end of uh, .NET, you have Microsoft SQL Server. So these are just the database systems, SQL Server and Postgres. Um, and, and really React, um, you know, React and Vue. I, you could just trim that because we already talked about the MERN stack. We're going to learn React. Um, Vue is another competitor. If you had to say there's, these are three front-end languages uh, that are uh, three front-end frameworks. It's React versus... Angular versus Vue. And these are three frameworks for the front end for developing in a, a JavaScript um, world. Now, if you're on this lecture, by the way, Grant, I don't know if you have this pulled up on your screen. If not, it's on Inside Ranking. You can access it uh, on the home page of our course. Um, but I want to point this out to you um, that in this, in this, um, slide deck, I have a link. Um, every year, there's a huge survey done on Stack Overflow. And you can see here 70,000 developers, and they ask them all sorts of questions. You can kind of see uh, here, and you can read an overview. Um, And so, you know, just to highlight, Angular is in its third year of the most dreaded technology surveyed by these users. React completes its fifth year as the most wanted. So whether that's developers wanting more of it or employers wanting more of it. Um, so there's, there's certainly a lot of data that you can sift through in this survey, and I would encourage you to do that. But to kind of highlight the technology stack, and you go to most popular technologies, um, kind of notice here, JavaScript is up at the top. And so that's why we're learning MERN. Um, we're learning MERN um, because, because JavaScript is so popular, HTML, CSS, SQL, Python has really been gaining. Um, certainly that, that doesn't come as a surprise to me. I've seen it trending in the last several years. TypeScript is interesting. Because what TypeScript is, is um, you know, basically introducing strict types into JavaScript. Like right now, we're just like, oh, let. And the interpreter figures out the data type. Um, but in TypeScript, there are strict data types similar to C Sharp. So you kind of get into here, you get Java, and there's your C Sharp. And so these are the popular languages. And if you kind of just look at the top 10, we talk about JavaScript or excuse me, we have a whole year of curriculum on JavaScript. We cover HTML, CSS, we cover SQL, um, C Sharp. And so we're hitting a lot of these languages. Um, moving down, when it comes to databases, these are the most popular database systems. Okay, so um, you saw some of these database systems listed 
in, in my, my slide deck, right? MySQL, Postgres, and SQLite. Um, all three of those would be categorized as, they would be in this category of what's considered uh, normalized databases. Uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in the, in the lecture, but uh, normalized database where you have tables and those tables are linked together with relationships. And so when I say normalized, I, sh I should have better said a relational database management system. So an RDBMS, they have um, uh, relationships that link tables together. And so all three of these are relational database management systems. MongoDB is not a relational database management system. And we'll talk about NoSQL and <clears throat> what that is. And so you kind of look here, these are all three very popular. Uh, MongoDB has been around for 20-ish years and made a splash. And we're gonna talk about all the advantages of MongoDB. And then you get Microsoft SQL Server. This is Microsoft's product. So, so you know, just different companies that, that manage these um, database uh, DBMSs, database management systems. Um, but just kind of taking a look at the popularity of those. And uh, when it comes to cloud, uh, Amazon is kind of king when it comes to where do you host your um, where do you host your servers? Where do you host your applications? AWS has 50% market share according to this survey. Microsoft and then Google. Google Cloud um, uh, um, is, is um, picking up steam, I think. Um, and so you can kind of see some different cloud platforms. Um, Ah, and then finally, what are the popular web frameworks? Again, Node, React, that's what this class is. So that's great to see that we are teaching the most popular web frameworks. And then when you get down into .NET Core, so this is your Microsoft world. So we're kind of teaching number one, number two, and number six. But if you look in between here, well, we are teaching Express. And then all these other things are just other JavaScript frameworks. So we're hitting our the most popular JavaScript frameworks, and then we're hitting another technology stack, be it the, the Microsoft technology stack. Um, so that's kind of how we look at it, is we're hitting popular frameworks in JavaScript, and then we're, we're hitting the uh, popular framework in, in the Microsoft.net world. Grant, how much of this um, have you seen before or were you familiar with, or is this all kind of new for you? Um, it's pretty new. I think you showed this website right at the beginning of the class, and I, I browsed through it a little bit, but I don't think I got down to uh, like these, these pages yet. Yeah, nice. Yeah, this is just a really good source of information. Now, they take the survey in May, so there is a new one that's going to be released before too long. So this one's 2022. So just kind of hit that real quick. Um, so again, we're working in the we're we're working in the MERN stack. I you know even highlight that um, to say hey, this is this is what we're working in. Um, and then, and then this lecture is specifically on the M. And this week, we're just going to be focusing on Mongo, and basically working with data inside of a Mongo database system. Um, and then, what we learn to do is tie in what we've already done, which is to make a, a web application that kind of just sits there and waits for requests. And then it's going to tie into a Mongo database. So then it can service those database requests. So that's kind of like step one. Step two is where we are today. We did step one. We're on step two. And then where we're going moving forward is, is step three, which is tying those two things together. Um, okay. So... You know, I don't know how much you have worked with um, relational 
databases. So Grant, kind of give me your background on what you've done with relational databases as I break my slide and put it back together. Um, I remember in, I think this C Sharp class, which for me that was in, this is probably in November. Yep. Um, we did a small amount of database work. Cool. With, um, I, I think it was, I don't remember if it was MySQL or Microsoft. Um, yep. Probably so Microsoft was, SQL Server. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. So just a little bit of that, just kind of at the tail end of the semester, linking some stuff up. Okay. So did you have these terms like primary key and foreign key? Yes, yes. And so do you remember like a primary key is a way you uniquely identify a row? Right, right. So like you're not going to have two rows in the same table that are duplicates because a primary key is going to kind of enforce that rule? Yes, and then you use kind of a foreign key, it kind of links it up. Yeah. A different table, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, Here, like there's an orders table, right? So, you, uh, and, and for an order, you need a customer. And so you notice they have a customer ID. Presumably, there's a customer's table with a customer ID. And so in the customer's table, there's a customer ID, and that ID is one that represents grant. And um, here is, a, is an order ID. Well, here's an order items table. This says order item one, so this is a foreign key, this is a primary key over here, uh, has a product ID and a quantity. And so, um, you know, I'm sure that just was just like a matrix of just jumping through things, but that's kind of what it is to work with tables in a relational database system, is you just have a bunch of different tables um, that are linked together through these primary and foreign key columns, and then, you wind up with tables like this that are just a bunch of numbers that kind of link things together. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, yeah, this is ringing a bell. Okay, cool. And so um, we're gonna talk about some of the problems with relational database systems and kind of where they came from and why a system like Mongo uh, was created. Okay, but but you know, it's just worth noting that in relational databases, which again, looking at popularity, you know, relational databases are still some of the most popular database systems. So there's still a lot of software that runs on top of relational databases. And so it's not to say that this NoSQL uh, or Mongo has replaced them. It's not, we still need to learn relational databases. Uh, but they, they kind of have some problems that we'll kind of get into. Um, whereas in Mongo, data is stored in a much more similar format. If you look at this uh, line of code here, this is what's called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. And so, what we ultimately have here is an object. You can see those curly braces on the outer, on the outer rim there. Um, those outer curlies means that inside we have an object. And so this is nothing but a JavaScript object. And our relationships, they're still, they still exist. Um, but you're gonna see, like for example, this order, this order has an order ID you're gonna notice that that just looks like a string of, of random numbers and letters um, instead of just number one, two, three, four, five, like we were looking at back here. Um, this order has an order ID and it has a relationship, this order has a relationship with an array of items. So array, uh, relationships do exist in, in Mongo, they just exist differently. Instead of existing as primary keys and foreign keys, kind of linking everything together, you assess, uh, essentially get nested objects. And so you have items inside of orders. And so it's just, it's just different. 
Um, it's just a very different way of storing data. Um, and again, it's familiar and nice to us as people who have been learning JavaScript because, you know, we know how to work with JavaScript objects. Um, and so when you have a database that's storing your data as JSON, um, it's really easy to pull the data out and work with it in JavaScript, right? So it's, it's kind of, um, you know, it's the same on the back end as it is on the front end. It's just one language and that's JavaScript and that's nice. Um, and you can kind of see a second order. Now you could, you're gonna notice these orders have different IDs. That, that one ends in 61, this one ends in 76. So I'm, if I'm looking at a second order, um, it's actually nice and flexible because I'm, if I'm looking at this, I see red leather cowboy boots is the first item. Uh, boot socks and belt. Okay, boot socks. So let's, let's look at boot socks. Boot socks, which is the second item here, had a price of 15 and a quantity of four. And down here, boot socks has a product price of 18 and a quantity of one. Maybe they ran a sale and they actually paid a different price. Um, that's actually something that's a little bit harder to do in a relational database uh, system. Your one product has one price and it, it it's not as flexible here. In this case, you could see that boot socks, someone paid 15 bucks for it. On a separate order, someone else paid 18 bucks for it. And that's more real world, right? I mean, prices are gonna go up and down based on supply and demand and all these factors, you run a sale, so on and so forth. Um, and so that's just kind of the first thing to realize. There's relational databases, first off, and then these are often called NoSQL databases. We're going to get into NoSQL and what that means. Um, but they just store uh, uh, data in JSON format. Um, and there's some advantages that we're going to kind of dive into of working with this, besides just being JavaScript in one language for the front end and the back end. Okay, um, so NoSQL. Um, Not a good, not a good term for for really what it is. It's it's not a good uh, uh, term to describe because what is SQL? Well, SQL is structured query language, and so you see something like no SQL, and you say, oh, you know, I'm not going to be writing uh, SQL statements, and that's actually not true. You can write SQL statements against no SQL databases. So again, bad term, um, but let's dive into actually what it is and. Um, again, so it's NoSQL, like Mongo, versus relational database systems like MySQL, Postgres, and SQLite, uh, and Microsoft SQL Server. So that's kind of what we're uh, comparing here. And so you could uh, read into the confusion here. I think the, the slide says, I'll just read it out loud. When people use the term NoSQL, they're typically using it to refer to a non-relational database. Some say the term NoSQL stands for not relational, while others stand it says not only SQL. So N-O, not only SQL. But again, when you see NoSQL, you say, oh, I can't write SQL, and that's not the case. Either way, most agree that NoSQL databases are databases that store data in a format other than relational tables. And so that's really what NoSQL means. NoSQL really means you just don't have the traditional tables linked together by their primary and foreign keys. That's what NoSQL means. That doesn't mean there's not relationships. There are relationships, as I covered in here, um, you, you've got nested documents, that is a relationship. These items are related to this order. Um, and so NoSQL does not mean no relationships and it does not mean no structured query language. It means not only structured query language and again, basically no primary key, foreign key relationships. 
um, or at least they're not strictly enforced. Okay, I kind of hit on this one is that they do, another misconception is that there, you know, there are no relationships. There are relationships, they're just different. Um, and, and that is typically done with nesting. As I demonstrated, your items, uh, your items in this case, are an array of, of objects inside of, uh, nested inside of another object. Um, and so in here, um, pull up this link. It's a really good read on what is NoSQL. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of that, that was pulled and this lecture was pulled from this article. Um, so we'll kind of get to it. And and uh, actually, this is exactly, well, well, I do cite my sources at the bottom. So these three to four slides, five, six slides are all from that article. OK. Um, so NoSQL was birthed in the late 2000s. Uh, Grant, you're a 20-year-old guy. You were also birthed in the early 2000s, right? Late 90s. <laughs> late 90s. All right. So NoSQL's been around for about as long as you have. Uh, maybe, maybe you're, yeah, you're, you're uh, maybe a decade older. So if it really was in the late 2000s. Um, so kind of what happened in the days of, of old, um, you ever seen computers that look like this? Like computers were the size of a room? Uh, not, not in person, no. Uh, are you ever, like, you've seen a picture on the internet maybe? Like, uh, yeah. or you've heard, you've heard like the early computers were like literally the size of a big room? Yeah. And so like when you're looking at this, this hard drive was, was the size of this human being, right? And how much data storage was on that hard drive? Well, 250 meg. Uh, well, roughly 1,024 meg is a gig, and 1,024 gig is a terabyte. And do you know how many terabyte hard drive you have on your on your desktop or your laptop? Uh, I think I've got two terabytes. Yeah, you've got two terabytes on your on your computer, and it fits well within a compact space, right? So suffice to say, devices have not only shrunk in size, but um, you know, as uh, as uh, the doubling of technology, what's it? Moore's law? You've heard of Moore's law? Technology doubles every seven years, things like that. It gets faster, it gets cheaper, uh, it gets smaller, and so in the old days, like this chart, like going back to the '60s, you know, these computers used to be really expensive, right? And so you get a cost per megabyte of well, six thousand dollars you know, per meg uh, to store on your hard drive. And of course, with Moore's Law, which by the way, I think is traditionally just about processing speed, not necessarily about all things in technology, but that's okay. Um, you know, certainly hard drives have not only gotten smaller, they've gotten faster and um, cheaper. And so you can kind of see the trend line of the cost of storage and so you can kind of look at today, a modern hard drive is uh, it plugs right into the motherboard. It's called the M.2 drive, and it's pretty small. Um, and it's pretty cheap per, per megabyte of data. Very, very cheap. And you can see, you know, 0 0.000002 per meg. Why is this relevant? This is relevant because relational database systems were invented back in the 60s. And back in the 60s and back in the 50s and the 70s, I don't know the exact year, back then it was very expensive to store data on a hard drive. And so when you had a database management system, one of the most important things to do was not waste space because it's so expensive to store data. Well, guess what? 50 years later, 
that has changed. What's expensive today is not the hardware. The hardware is a cheap commodity, okay? All the value is in the developers. And what costs money today is a big development team. Uh, I heard it said last week on a podcast that I listened to, and spoken by a smart guy in Silicon Valley, says that developers are the number one industry in America with uh, a lack of uh, uh, employees. And so, um, you know, supply and demand in this industry, we have the biggest lack of supply of developers compared to any other industry in America. We need, there's more job demand and not enough developers uh, compared to any other industry. And, um, you know, take that for what that's worth. That's just me repeating what I heard on a podcast. But what does that mean? Developers that are talented and even average developers are paid handsomely today um, to, to, to build software. And so, you know, kind of go back to side 11. Um, when, when the prices of hard drives went down, developers rather than storage were becoming the primary cost for software development. And so when you had relational database systems, like one of the main things that they're meant to do is just store the data one time. Like, hey, I'm gonna store Grant's name one time in the database, I'm not gonna repeat Grant's name. I'm not gonna store my customer twice. Why would I store my customer name twice? Because that would be wasting space. And so everything was built in relational database management systems to optimize for storage, not optimize for things that are important today. What's not important today is storage space. You wanna store someone's name five times, it doesn't matter because it's so cheap to do so. Um, and so, what is important today? What's important today is that applications are fast, right? Do you like waiting on your application to load? Of course not. Uh, no. Yeah, of course no. not, of course not. Um, so, you know, there's always that scale of priorities and it's kind of like a three-way scale. It's like, you know, how cheap is something and what is the quality and you know this is kind of one of those things where you know you can't um the priorities have shifted over time we used to prioritize hard drive space now we prioritize application speed we we prioritize security um we we prioritize um developers because there's a shortage of them and um you know, they're expensive. Um, and so what is NoSQL? Well, NoSQL says unstructured data. Um, it is much more flexible in the way that you can put data in. Um, so, you know, for example, in a relational database like Microsoft SQL Server, you might have a column of data and you're gonna say, okay, I only accept integers in this column. Uh, whereas no SQL, you know, maybe at some point in time, you're putting integers into that column and then you change it and you make strings. There's advantages and disadvantages to being flexible like that, um, but that's that's one way of looking at it is like, hey, you know, I'm this database, um, as your application needs change, you don't also have to change your database. And so like, hey, at some point, you know, I was storing strings in this column, now I'm storing integers, now I'm storing doubles, and it just kind of works in Mongo and NoSQL, it's flexible. And so like when I think of Mongo database, I just think of a really flexible database that as the application evolves and as the application, you know, uh, iterates and changes, um, this database is very flexible so it can accept data in all sorts of 
in all sorts of ways. Uh, you kind of highlight this here. This data came in all shapes and sizes, structured, semi-structured, polymorphic, there's a fun word from your C sharp, uh, uh, and defining the schema in advance became nearly impossible. And so, um, you know, the idea of software development is that no one writes perfect code the first time through. And so, um, software development has gone through different methodologies and maybe you've heard of what was considered waterfall. The waterfall methodology was really the main methodology used in the world of software development, um, which was similar to building a house. You know, the way you build a house, generally speaking, is you plan, 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 blueprints and meetings up front and get all the details ironed out and um, you know, uh, then you order the materials and then you build the house that's on the blueprint. Um, and so in the early days of software development, be it the first 50, 60, 70 years, we use this kind of waterfall methodology. It's kind of, in other words, if you think of a waterfall, you know, it starts at the top, you go through this process of like planning, implementation, you know, uh, you know, all the way to handing the keys off to the front door, right? It's a one-way street. You start by planning your software, and at the end of the day, you deliver a product, and it is what it is. Uh, you know, I think of uh, old video games that way. Old video games, I, I kind of grew up with Nintendo 64. I played GoldenEye, right? And when you when you got that GoldenEye game, right, that was a finished product. There was no patching GoldenEye. Right, developers had to write code so that that game worked how it worked, and at the end of the day, you know, you shift that product out the door, and there was no patching. Um, and that was the old days of software, um, this waterfall methodology. Nowadays, you know, um, software development follows a different methodology called agile. And if you kind of look at the agile uh, manifesto, most software development today takes place using a, an agile um, methodology instead of a waterfall. And what you do basically that's very different than waterfall is you just iterate, you make iterations. You know, you build a product for two weeks, you show it to the customer, they tell you how to fix it. You build that for two more weeks, you show it to the customer, they show you how to fix it. And so, um, Mongo, how this ties into Mongo, is that you never know the software that you're gonna build on day one because it's always changing, it's always evolving, it's always, uh, you know, it's always changing. Because your software is always changing, you never know what's it gonna be, so what you build on day one is gonna be completely different than what you ship, you know, it's gonna be different than what you patch in, in three years. Um, and And so, Mongo is more conducive to an agile software development methodology. And so kind of an interesting link to, to read up on um, uh, the agile uh, software development manifesto. So basically a group of developers, they got together and they said, hey, we value this over that. And so we value A over B. And so to just kind of read off of this, um, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value, again, A over B, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation. It was also the case in the old days of software, you would just document the daylights out of your software. I mean, I remember um, um, manuals that were thick. I, I remember buying like a video game and again getting like a folder that was um, uh, almost like a telephone book, like thick, thick manual to how to play this video game. So comprehensive documentation. Uh, again, they, they value working software over documentation customer collaboration over 
contract negotiation, the idea of like, hey, we just want to make our customer happy, you know, versus in the old days, it was like, hey, we're going to build you this software. We're going to build it for you at this price. If you change your mind, doesn't matter. You're going to pay us and this is what we're building. Um, so, so more of an iterative, like just make the customer happy. If we need to modify the contract to charge them more or charge them less, then, then that's what we need to do. Responding to change over following a plan. Um, and so, so yeah, the, the idea is that Mongo is much more conducive to an agile methodology versus kind of the old school waterfall. Um, making sense? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, by the way, you know, at the end of this, what we do is we actually do a, a dive into into actually Mongo. We install Mongo and we get working in it. Okay, this is just the just the introduction. Okay, again, NoSQL just means non-relational database. Again, I don't want to harp on any of these slides too hard um, because there's still a lot of relational databases out there. Again, they're still very popular, um, but they, again, they're old, right? They've been around forever. And because they're old and they were designed for different purposes, they come with some problems. Um, again, to kind of highlight relational databases um, were designed for a world in the 50s and 60s where hardware was expensive, um, both your hard drive and your RAM. Software engineers were cheaper than hardware. Um, actually, in the old days, software engineers, you know, you might know some people like this. It was, I never studied to be a software engineer. I was a manager, I was a, you know, I had this role in the company, I had that role with the company. Um, and it's like, hey, you're most our, you're, you're one of our trusted managers, you're one of our trusted employees. So now we're gonna promote you to do this other thing because we know you'll get the job done. So software engineers were just like seasoned people at a corporation. Uh, they might not have any background at all. They, you know, they might be like, you know, they might be in biology or something and they're a chemical engineer or something, right? And, uh, but they're like, eh, we trust you, so you're gonna be a software engineer. Um, in, the, in the old days, right, you didn't, you didn't have websites with millions of users. Um, so databases were designed at a time where, you know, you wouldn't have that many users all at once. Uh, the internet did not exist yet, right? The internet didn't become mainstream until the 90s. Um, you know, and again, business requirements were well known and mostly static. That's just not the case today. By the time you start building some software, you know, again, uh, what the business wants is going to change. Uh, the world is going to move. The world moves fast. Things change fast. And, um, you know, when you start building software, um, business requirements, in other words, the software that the business wants you to build is often cloudy, right? Um, Grant, been teaching long enough, you know, I will tell you, I've heard it on more than one occasion where developers, you know, they start learning development. You, there's a learning curve there, right? And you you got to get out in the real world and, and gain experience on that side of the house. But there's a whole nother aspect of a software developer is they have to understand the business. They have to understand, um, you know, for example, I've had a graduate over at Anheuser-Busch and they said, Evan, you know, the hardest part for me is understanding the brewing process and all these systems that are in place, you know, to brew beer for Anheuser-Busch. Um, and that's often the case. You know, you're going to go into accounting. You're going to go into um, manufacturing. You're going to go into all these different industries that exist. And you have to understand the business and the software. 
And so you're not going to understand all those business terms. You're not going to understand all these things. And that's going to be another learning curve you're going to have to go through in whatever industry you end up in. Um, so when it comes to business requirements, probably not well known because you're learning the business itself. And when it says mostly static in the old days, now, now again, everything's changing, everything's moving. You know, I don't even know, you know, and I'm sure there's some statistics out there. It's like, how many software products by the time they actually get built, do they even like, oh, well, we don't need that anymore because things have changed. Um, and so that was the old days, right? Databases today, you know, you might need to handle a couple thousand users at once, right? Hopefully. Hopefully that's a problem that you have, right? You build a piece of software that's in high use. Um, you know, I, I think of a, a developer I've had working over at um, Enterprise Rent-A-Car and they're working on the, the, the software to reserve cars. Well, car rentals happen in business. Everyone travels nowadays and there's how many hundreds of thousands of users that have to rent a car on any given day. Um, so a lot of users using your system at the same time, that used to not be the case. Uh, you know, you need to handle millions or even billions of records. Um, well, a record is an entry in a database. And so for every user, there's an entry. For every purchase, there's an entry. Um, you've heard of Internet of Things and all these devices that are connected. And, you know, there are, for example, just as an example, you know, there are sensors out in the farmland of America, just making something up, that are gaining reads, you know, every second we're reading temperature, we're reading wind, we're reading, you know, so there are these sensors that are saving every second, they're saving all this information into a database somewhere, right? Because that information is important information to the farmer, right? What is the average temperature? What is the average humidity? What is the average wind? all this kind of stuff, right? So when you have Internet of Things, another good example uh, would be smart cars, right? Teslas, right? They got cameras all around them. They're recording all the time, sending that information back to headquarters so they can make autonomous cars, you know? It's another example of like a sensor or a camera that's recording something. Do you have any like smart cameras on your house or, or internet connected devices like a thermostats or anything? No, I don't. Well, that's probably very secure. <laughs> um, and so again, just kind of the needs have changed. Um, again, we're kind of just talking about problems um, with relational databases. Um, in relational databases, you have auto-incremented primary keys. So again, kind of going back to your semester last semester, did you like create a table and like have an auto incrementing column by chance? I think so, yeah. Right, so it's like customer number one, customer number two, customer number three, customer number four, right? That kind of thing? Yeah. And so you just had this auto incrementing column that was acting as the primary key and if it's just auto incrementing, then you're guaranteed that no two rows are exactly the same because at minimum that one column would be different because it's just auto incrementing. Um, that's good to like begin learning because it makes sense to just auto increment a number. Um, but there's a problem with that, right? So like if you're customer number 500, then I already know if I'm a competitor of your business and I go generate a new customer ID and I'm customer 501, well, now I know something about your company. I know you only have 500 customers. So do you see a security kind of design flaw there? Right, yeah. Right, so, so that's usage statistics. So auto-incrementing in relational databases kind of reveals some data to outside people who are maybe kind of somewhat savvy. Uh, therefore, I can also, you know, 
maybe begin to attack. Well, if I know that I'm customer number 500, I know that, you know, if I'm, if you're, if I'm 501, I know there's a customer 500. So let me start trying to run some queries against customer 500, right? Or 499 or 498 or 497. Like if I have a piece of your information, I can begin to start guessing at some attacks and how I might, you know, read customer records. Um, and then it's also the case that database servers have to be replicated. And so if you're located on the East Coast and I'm located on the West Coast and you generate a new customer number, it has to replicate that data from one server to another. Um, otherwise, we would both be you know, the next customer number. Um, so that synchronization slows things down, right? So there's some security issues here with auto increment and there's some speed issues here with, with auto increment. And so Mongo, Mongo doesn't have auto incrementing columns for those reasons. Um, and so that's, that's a good thing. It's also the case, um, that Mongo does not have strict, what are called foreign key constraints. Um, a foreign key constraint says this. Again, I keep using Grant, you're, you're my customer 501. Well, in order for my customer 501 to have an order, um, I, I, I need a customer number from the customer's table. In order to put that 501 into my orders table. And so I cannot have an order without a valid customer ID. And that is a strict rule that enforces some of those, you know, data replication things that we were talking about, why relational databases were created in the first place. Um, Mongo does not have a foreign key constraint. These foreign key constraints will slow down your software because of kind of the same thing, the synchronization between database servers. Um, when you go to update one table, it needs to lock the other table that it's concerned with. Um, and so Again, that's, that, that boils down to a speed concern. Um, and then when you're storing the data in separate places, I don't know if you've actually ever written like a complex join situation where you're joining in three or four or five tables back together, but you're basically storing the data in multiple different places. Therefore, when you go to like update that data, you have to lock all those tables, which is a problem. But then also when you're compiling the data back together to read all that information out of the database, those, those joins um, are also not the speediest thing. Um, so what does it boil down to? This auto increment and these foreign key constraints, there's security concerns, and again, just more speed concerns. Today, we have speed concerns. We're not concerned about duplicate data. We're not concerned about hard drive space and the cost of you know, replicating our data across multiple hard drives. Now it's like, hey, I want my software to be fast. That's my main concern. And I want my software developers to develop it in a reasonable amount of time. Like those are high concerns. Um, and then moving on, tables do not allow for nested documents in arrays. Um, relational databases store what are called scalar values. So when you're looking at any individual column and, and row intersection at that cell, when you're looking at individual cells, there's no nested. It is a scalar value, meaning it is a single value. Um, so a scalar, a scalar um, value in a database basically means you can store Um, a single value. There it is. A scalar value refers to a single value. 
And so in a cell, you know, you cannot have like an array of data in a cell. And so like if you have a, a, a table that represents your blog posts, you know, so you have a blog and then you have categories, right? Like this is a category of sports and entertainment, right? So those are two categories that belong to this blog post. Well, you're going to wind up with multiple tables there um, because in any individual cell, you cannot store multiple um, pieces of data. It is a single data. Um, and so again, that, that just boils down to um, more problems. Now, you know, all of this is kind of harping on problems with relational databases. That's not really what I want to focus on because again, this is not a relational database system that we're building. It's just pointing out why several reasons here, why Mongo could be viewed as, um, I mean, it's a newer technology and more modern approach. Um, when when you develop uh, in C Sharp, you'll, you'll work with what's called the Entity Framework, and the Entity Framework is an object relational mapper. ORMs have their own problems. Um, you know, the ideas that you, um, it's kind of like a middleman between the database and the objects in your application. And so it maps the database tables to the objects in your app. Um, but again, they kind of come with performance problems. So they write some SQL code for you. That SQL code might not be the most efficient um, and, and what have you. Now, um, this is something that, you know, when we're working with Mongo, uh, JSON, you kind of saw, is the natural language of Mongo. And for the longest time, a lot of relational database systems did not support JSON. Um, so some databases have added JSON types. Um, Microsoft, SQL Server, and JSON. So you can work with JSON data in Microsoft SQL Server, um, but it's actually not a, a data type that you can put on a column. Um, and so there is no like built-in type uh, for JSON. Um, but you could see here JSON functions were introduced in 16. And so there's some basically built in methods that will allow you to convert JSON data into relational database tables. Uh, let me close, 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 close. here um, but it just goes back to relational databases are not optimized for handling you know JSON data they've kind of made these different methods that will support JSON now what is JSON really used for you know um, XML and JSON are used to send information around from place to place and so from from the back end to the middle tier to the front end you know, JSON is kind of the standard way of transporting data. Uh, XML used to be that kind of format. Um, and if you've ever seen XML, XML was in tags. You know, if I were to put like a first name tag, Evan, and first name, that is what XML would look like. And, um, but again, both XML and JSON were transporters of data. 
and a problem with relational databases is they didn't kind of they weren't designed to work with it uh, like Mongo is. So kind of in the end here, which is this is my opinion, uh, relational databases are not optimized for today's applications. Um, so because of these reasons we've talked about, relational databases don't handle m more than a few thousand concurrent users. Um, you know, uh, you start having multiple users trying to access the same data, things get locked, tables get locked. Um, you know, one user is trying to update a record, then the other user can't access that data. And so the other user is getting error messages. Um, Relational databases are not optimized for distributed databases. Okay, Grant, I don't know if you're a gamer. I think you said you are a gamer. But what, what gamers know in a lot of cases is that you want like a local server, right? Because if you got a server on the other side of the United States, your ping is going to be higher, right? So for the fastest throughput, for the best in-game experience, you want local servers. Because you want local servers, servers that are close by you, you know, you got to replicate data. Um, and uh, relational databases aren't good at um, kind of being distributed because every update you need to do, you got to do on multiple tables, and then you have to replicate that across all the systems, um, which you don't have those problems nearly as much on Mongo. Relational databases are not optimized for unstructured and nested data, um, like JSON. JSON is unstructured, and you can have an array of items inside of an order, right? You have nested data, and that's all a JavaScript object, and you can see here, many relational databases don't even support nested data. Um, so, so yeah, that's an introduction to NoSQL, and that's kind of the, the pros and cons. Again, this, this is uh, an opinion slide on slide 23. Moving on to slide 24, I'll tell you what, Grant, we'll just take a quick five minutes, and then we'll continue on. Sounds good. Yep. Okay, let's kind of come in here and finish this up. Um, MySQL, going back to that popularity, was the most popular relational database management system versus Mongo, uh, which is our most popular NoSQL uh, database. Kind of compare and contrast them. They use different ter terms, right? So it's just kind of nice to see like a table in MySQL, you know what a table is. You know, if you've ever worked in Excel, you've got rows and columns. Uh, so a table is broken down into rows and columns. And so in Mongo, uh, you've got collections. A collection is a table. And then one row is called the document. Um, and then a column uh, is, a, is a field. And uh, where, where the actual cell is inside, you know, the intersection of the row and the column. Well, you know, at the intersection of the document, you've got a field, and then, you know, you basically have your property, um, which is where your data is. Um, so kind of to hop on back, um, this whole JavaScript object um, is called your document. Um, and then you've got again kind of going back to the right and then a uh, column well really it comes down to the property well we know what a property is in purple are your properties and then the values are in the blue and the red um, and so the terminology is a little confusing uh, when you're changing because whole life I've been used to tables, rows, columns, and fields. Um, and I, maybe I butchered this because I, I just made changes to this recently and I feel like I might have messed that up. So I, I'll, I'll double check my work here because I, I, I changed that recently. Now I'm second guessing myself. 
Um, so what is a schema though? You notice I did skip over a schema. Um, the schema is essentially your blueprint of all of the uh, collections that you're going to to uh, have in a in a relational database. A schema defines all of your tables, and in a uh, NoSQL a schema defines all of your collections and your data types and um, you know the relationships between those tables. Um, so in in MySQL the schema is like pretty strict. It's hard to change. You can see is is difficult and slow to change. Um, all rows. Um, uh, and so basically your columns have data types is what this is saying. So all your columns have data types. So all the rows that, you know, line up in the columns, they all have the same data types. And, you know, your software is written around that schema. So you're, you're kind of hard coding uh, your, your application to work with a strict database set of plans. Um, Whereas on MongoDB, the schema is much more flexible. And so you never have to define a schema. You know, you can kind of add collections, which are tables, and you can add fields, kind of add them as needed. It's just all more flexible. Documents in a collection uh, can have different fields or different data types. And so that kind of goes back to that polymorphic example. Um, and your application can easily handle changes to the schema uh, when it doesn't uh, conform. And so, just more flexible. Um, you know, this is basically your database plan in a, in a traditional sense is much more rigid, Mongo much more flexible. Uh, in MySQL, um, your fields, you know, so your columns either allow nulls or they don't. And so you can you can have in MySQL you can have uh, required columns you mark them as not null, otherwise nulls are allowed. Um, in a Mongo, you know it's it's all completely optional, right? All fields are optional in the database. Um, if you need a required field, then you have to use um, application validation, kind of what we did in our last hands-on test, is we were writing. JavaScript to validate the data. And so we're going to learn how to write um, server-side validation, which is a, um, a package called Joy. Um, so we'll, in, a, in our Node and Express world, we'll bring in a package called Joy to do some, some validation on our data. Um, in MySQL, you have primary keys. Those auto primary keys can auto-increment. Uh, or you could have a uh, like what's called a GUID or uh, universal unique identifier. Um, so you gotta kind of have some options over here. On Mongo, um, every document will have a an underscore ID that will uniquely identify it. And so you basically have a primary key uh, that had that must have the name underscore ID. And it winds up being uh, a unique string or preferably an object ID. And an object ID is one of those um, globally unique identifiers, something like this. This is an object ID. It's just a um, completely random numbers and letters and it's like a not impossible to duplicate but it's very rare that you have two uh, and by very rare, I mean practically impossible to have two of the same matching object IDs. Um, so it's a way of uniquely identifying each row or each document inside of a collection. The main thing over here is Mongo does not have the auto-incrementing primary keys. Instead, we have an object ID for our, for our GUID. Um, MySQL can have a foreign key constraint. Mongo database does not have a way to enforce uh, the validity of a foreign key, and we call this a good thing. Keeping in mind that those foreign key constraints slow down our relational databases, and so not having those strict rules um, um, can actually help our software perform faster. 
Um, you can notice you, you can have a foreign key uh, property though. And so you notice you add a field um, to reference like here. This is a product ID right here that that field, this product ID is referencing another product in a product collection. And so this is acting like a foreign key, but you don't actually have the strict rule enforcing those rules. Um, uh, that, that the database rule, I should say, the database constraint enforcing that foreign key constraint. Um, unique constraints, this is kind of like your primary key. Primary key is the idea is that it enforces uh, uniqueness in a table. Um, and so unique constraints in MySQL are defined as part of the table schema. So when you're defining the table, you define the unique constraint. Typically you say it's primary key unique. Um, it can be one or more columns. So if you want to have like a compounded primary key, you can do that. Two columns that come together to make up your primary key. Um, all rows in the table must satisfy this constraint at all times. And so this is, again, a strict rule that MySQL has or relational databases. Um, on Mongo, um, you don't have a unique constraint. You have what's called a unique index. So if you want to enforce uniqueness uh, in Mongo, you add what's called a unique index. Um, and so you, you can enforce, you know, for example, um, if you go back here to your orders, you know, we're going to have a unique index that says all of our orders have to be unique. So basically forcing uh, all of our orders to have a unique ID, for example. So it, it is a rule that you could still enforce. And... Um, lastly, but not least, uh, indexes. You know, you have a book index, you want to look up a term, you go to the index, you look up alphabetically, you look up the word, it tells you what page in the book. Uh, databases have indexes as well. Um, and just like in MySQL, you add the indexes to the tables. In Mongo, indexes are added to a collection. And both of them do the same thing. They kind of help you, uh, find uh, or perform lookups faster. Uh, you can see here they're vital to application performance. So in both cases, ex indexes still exist. And so that's a good thing. Okay, last but not least, I'm gonna kind of stop the, the first recording here. Now, um, we're gonna go through some software installation together next. I'm just gonna put it on a different, um, different video so we can kind of walk through actually installing these different tools and connecting to Mongo.